a little note to indicate one of the effects of this program. It's a brief one. God love you. You are the only person who can keep my wife quiet for a full half hour. <laughs> Since one good turn deserves another, I am enclosing one dollar for the poor of the world for which you are caring. <laughs> Any other men have wives that sleep? Reminds me of the man that I heard about. He hadn't spoken to his wife in 15 days. He didn't want to interrupt her. Would you like to hear something about psychiatry and psychology tonight? If so, let us start with first the normal, briefly, the normal. Every human being has a vital principle inside of him which manifests itself in terms of urges, impulses, passions. Sometimes these have been called concupiscences. There are three of them, principally. One, there is self-perfection of the human mind. If we did not have that drive within us, we would never seek to perfect ourselves intellectually or socially. Now we have another drive. Because man not only has a mind or a head, He's got a body. You see, in five years, six years, I haven't learned to draw any better. So there's another impulse, which is directed to the body and its pleasures, and particularly this, just as this is self-perfection of the mind, so this is self-perpetuation of the human species. Now, in addition to these two urges that we have, one of mind and body, we also have an urge to that which is outside of us, namely the world. For example, well, the ownership of property. I have an urge to own things, for example, like... Uh, an automobile. You know, listen. If there are any automobile designers working, I hope sometimes they give as much room in the future to people in the back seat as they do to a spare tire. <laughs> well, that's property. Now, these are very normal urges, and a person must not think, for example, that there's something wrong with him simply because he wants to perfect his mind, or because he wants to generate human species, or because he wants to own property. These things are normal. Now it can happen, of course, that these will not always be controlled by reason or by the law of God. And when these impulses and passions and concupiscences and urges get the better of us, then this natural urge for self-perfection of the mind can become pride, egotism, selfishness. The urge of the body, self-perpetuation of the human species, when not subject to law and right reason, can become what used to be called lust and sometimes today is called sex, though not properly. And the third urge, if not controlled by reason, could become avarice, selfishness, or worldliness. Now these understand are abnormal, not normal. Now we come to the science of psychiatry. In which is psychiatry interested? The normal or the abnormal? The abnormal. Now there are three psychiatrists who are most important in the science. In other words, they have given the major development to the science, and I am not mentioning them in the order of their importance. 
the one scientist, or psychiatrist rather, concentrated on only one of these urges. And that was Adler. The second psychiatrist concentrated on the flesh, carnality, sex, that was Freud. The third, on security, relationship to the objective world, and that was Jung. These are the pioneers in psychiatry. But before we explain their theories, we must make a distinction. The American minds do not like distinctions, but you cannot think properly without distinctions. Now, the distinction that we make is between a method and a theory. Suppose one were interested in the study of falling bodies falling human bodies. Well, one way of investigating the study of fallen bodies would be through the camera. One might take pictures of human beings who fall. That would be a method of investigation. Now suppose you began explaining why the men fell. That's entirely different. Here you would be studying motives. Suppose one said, well, the reason this particular man jumped from the bridge was because someone called him a coward and he wanted to affirm his superiority. That's Adler theory. Suppose another one said, well, no, he was sexually maladjusted. Freud. The other one said he just wanted to show off. He was an extrovert, young. These are theories. How do they agree and how do they differ? First of all, they all agree on the method, which is good. The method is psychoanalysis. The major credit or the development of the method of psychoanalysis must be given to Sigmund Freud. Adler and Jung, once associated with him, broke because he was emphasized sex too much. What is psychoanalysis? Psychoanalysis starts with the proposition that in addition to a conscious mind, we also have an unconscious mind. Now, need I tell you, I can't draw. I don't even practice my drawing as I do not practice these telecasts. Oh, say, did you see? These are little octopuses that people sent me for the angel to erase the blackboard. <laughs> this is a little boy octopus and this is a little girl octopus. <laughs> he, he's hanging out by his halo, see? Now, this is the first floor of a house. I've got to put the, the, the stairs going downstairs. I've got to put it on the, on the outside of the house. But you understand what I mean. Now, <laughs> this is the stairs that goes down, see? <laughs> this is the cellar down here. So this is the unconscious mind. And this stands for the conscious mind, the first floor. And this is the cellar door. Now, just as many a housewife, for example, she has rags and bones and hanks of hair that she does not want on the first floor, she opens the cellar door and throws them down. Well, the mind does that too. The human mind often throws down in the unconsciousness, many ideas which are unpleasant, which it seeks to repress, which are embarrassing. So they are thrown down into the unconsciousness. And it is rarely that they get upstairs. Why? 
because there's a little man here that's called a sensor. And whenever some little thought that's down here starts coming up the stairs, this little sensor cracks him on the head. So he doesn't get up into consciousness. Well, does he ever get up? Oh, sometimes in dreams, say the psychoanalyst. But then the ideas are disguised. They do not come up as they really are. They come up in another form. You don't know what they mean, but the psychiatrist does. He knows. He'll tell you what they are, not for nothing, but he'll tell you. <laughs> now on this, all of them practically agree. And this method of studying the unconscious mind is valid and right and good and necessary in many circumstances. Now comes the theory. How do you explain the unconscious mind, what is in it, and its relation to the conscious mind? Here you get no agreement. Three schools, Adler, Freud, Young. Now let's take each of them one by one. Although it was Freud who started. Adler. Adler says that there is in everyone a drive for superiority. This drive for superiority is thwarted, for some reason or other. It's repressed, driven down into the unconsciousness. And it comes up in a disguised kind of way, what he calls an inferiority complex. So that the basic drive for superiority manifests itself by aggressiveness, by boasting, by loud mouthedness, selfishness, and a thousand other forms. In other words, it was Adler who gave us the words that are so often used, inferiority and superiority complex. That's one theory. Theory of Freud is this, that everyone is determined to be what he is, for the most part, during the first six years of his existence. During these first six years, a child senses a good many pleasures that are associated with certain organs of the body. In this unconsciousness too, and here I quote Freud verbatim, there is the urge to cannibalism, incest, and murder. Every boy has within himself an urge to kill his own father in order to marry his own mother. That is what is known as an Oedipus complex. Every girl has an urge to kill her own mother and marry her own father. That is an Electra complex. Now, one would like to recover later on in life these pleasures of the first six years that are down here in what Freud calls id, id being a Latin word for that, just plain T-H-A-T. -T. But up here in the consciousness, there is what he calls the ego and the superego. There's the taboos, there are the morals or conventions of society which repress these infantile urges, the id, which constitute human nature. Now there are many Freudians who say therefore the way to release many of these complexes is to allow the id 
an uninhibited outlet. I say there are some Freudians who teach that. That's another theory. The theory of Jung is that in the unconsciousness is not only just this primary sex impulse of Freud. There is not only the personal, but there is also what he calls a kind of a racial unconsciousness. That is to say, the collective unconsciousness of the whole human race. There are myths, symbols, and so forth, by which man is in a kind of a symbolic relationship with his past. Man is constantly trying to get in contact with the world, if he can, and some manifest this con contact with the world quite openly, and they become extroverts. And others find themselves at great pain in order to contact the world, and they remain inside of themselves. They are called the introverts. Now, those are the original theories of psychiatry explained as simply as possible. Note that none of them have explained the whole man. Each has taken a third. Each is one third right, incidentally. But they've not taken the whole man. Furthermore, they are only theories. The Rockefeller Foundation gave money enough to a professor of Harvard to analyze, for example, 116 articles and books, clinical studies, which were supposed to be explained on the Freudian theory alone, and the answer given after long, this long and expensive investigation was that these clinical cases could just as well be explained by any other theory. Now, it's important to remember that they are theories. The method is solid, the method endures. Now we come to a, a study, for that's what this is, a study of new developments in psychiatry. What is new? The first development is, and it breaks to some extent with the psychoanalytic approach, the recognition that man is a psychosomatic unit. Psycho, he has a mind. Somatic, he has a body. And the two are related one to the other. It has been proven by research, and I was recently talking to one of the doctors who is doing research along these particular lines. She is interested in the chemistry of the cell and metabolism. The scientist says that it is possible to notice the chemical changes in a cell where there is great fatigue. When the chemistry of the cell changes, it affects the glands, it affects the brain. Therefore, according to the newer developments, there is a often, not always, there is often a physiological basis for psychosis and neurosis. In other words, the reaction now is against a kind of an angelism which regards the subconscious mind as something floating around in space. Now it's related to a body, it's related to an organism, and the body has effect on the mind, and the mind has an effect upon the body. Then to the new drugs, the Rowolfia drug, drugs, the Torpomyzine drugs, all of these that were used first of all in treating heart trouble and also high blood pressure, now are found to have some effect not only in quieting, but in many instances of curing people who are suffering from mental diseases with the result that thanks to these new drugs, 
There are 17,000 less patients in mental hospitals now than there were at this time last year. Mental patients are not staying as long as they did before. In other words, in many instances, there is a physiological, biological, metabolical foundation for mental diseases. And where the, where the basis is chemical, psychoanalytic method will not do. That's one change. Another. And here, we're going to discuss principally those who still hold to the psychoanalytic method. There are a group of new psychiatrists which have left all of these passé. So when you go to a psychiatrist, be up to date. Get your money's worth. <laughs> the newer development in psychiatry recognizes that man is not only a unit of body and soul, but he's also a unit. They're getting back again, you see, to the fact that there is not only an unconscious mind, but there is also a conscious mind. And psychotherapy must now begin to take account of the two. Some of these leading psychiatrists from all over the world, Bonaventura, who was killed in Jerusalem, great loss indeed for the field of psychiatry. P. Caruso, Igor Caruso, Binswanger, Stalker, Carr, Holland, greatest of them all. Wilfred Dane, Rohrbacher, Lersch, and others. And what's the position of these psychiatrists? The position of these psychiatrists is, as one of them has put it, Bonaventura, there is something specifically human in man, namely his urge toward morality, that sometimes his unconscious mind can be controlled. Sometimes there may be a sense of guilt, and the psychiatrist must take account of it. But on the whole, all of these psychiatrists are now getting back to the fact that man and this, and this practically all of them agree, man has an intellect and a will. He has reason. He has the power of choice. In other words, he's a responsible being. And they're trying to give, as Carpus said, some significance to life. And the meaning that they attach to existence and the problem of values has a tremendous effect upon them. These psychiatrists are saying that it's not enough merely to analyze, for example, to find the dead acorn from which the oak came. You do not explain the oak by that rotted acorn. When a ship is sinking, it is not merely enough to analyze the waters that pour into the hold of the vessel. We cannot explain, for example, the statue of David by Michelangelo by saying that the marble was six million years in the bowels of the earth. You explain it also by something else. Namely, you explain it by the intellect, and the artistic skill, and the resolution of Michelangelo. So too psychiatrists now, even though they use the psychoanalytic method, as Dane does, they're now getting back to the fact that man is not an animal, that he's rational. In other words, there's now not just a psychoanalysis, but there's also a psychosynthesis. And psychiatry, therefore, is making great strides physically with these drugs that I mentioned. And now we might almost say, in a true psychological sense, by recovering the true nature of man. And may I plead, particularly with college students, to insist that they be given, in addition to abnormal psychology in their classes, a little bit of normal psychology. Not everyone in this world is cracked. We're reasonable beings, and we ought to know, and our teachers should tell us. 
Namely, that we have not only a body, but we've got a soul, and we have reason, and we have the power of choice. We cannot be told that freedom of the world is in danger, and then be told the next moment by an antiquated school of psychoanalysts or psychiatrists that man has no freedom, that he's been determined completely by infantile urges. In other words, if we are to discover the full glory of this science, even with a psychoanalytic method, we will do it by recognizing the truth of what St. Augustine has said, our hearts were made for thee, O God, and they are restless until they rest in thee. Bye now, and God love you.